So you're listening to a podcast about buildings and cities. I'm Luke Jones. I'm George Kinjal. We're back. You join us for the second part of our discussion of urbanism and having set out those 10 chapters worth of general principles and uh, historical analysis and statistics and um, cuttings from newspapers. Graphs. Graphs. All sorts uh, of... <laughs> big square, little square equals little square, little square, big square. Yeah. All sorts of principles. Uh, I mean, do you want to do you want to recap for the people? I know for us it's been about forty five seconds, but for them it's probably been about three weeks, given our general editing schedule. Actually, we could just do the general principles which she's outlined, which That's are grid. Man is in a cosmic order; he must overcome nature. Things must be in grids. Yes. Primary shapes are good, not only aesthetically but morally. Yeah. The historic city. We've got to put it in order to allow the circulation of traffic that's one we could do this as a kind of a quiz if I can yeah well I w- i'd say there's still some general points which is that like we want great rooms in the city we want our like you know the city should be all alike in detail but in variety of urban spaces yeah it should be full of trees yeah yeah, yeah. and then it's the actual specifics of the city which is that great cities are really vital to culture yes it must be unblocked um, it must be decongested, cut through and opened up. It must be green and have lots of green spaces. It must have tons of transport and speed. Yes. And it must densify. It must be super dense in the centre so that like the evolutionary process can be accelerated. This sort of quasi-magical way of thinking about what goes on in the cities is it's pretty general, actually, isn't it? People have stupid theories for things they don't understand, and it's very hard to understand cities because they're very complex. There isn't really any way of understanding, is there? So, I mean, you do always end up with various kinds of magic. I was always thought, always that was always my view of um, the '90s discourse around iconic buildings and uh, the idea that you were go- that you that um, the Bilbao effect. Yeah, the Bilbao effect. Cities would be magically sort of transfigured from post-industrial dereliction and sadness into um hip cool suavity by the construction of a few significant symbolically futuristic and avant-garde uh, baubles of various kinds you can see why architects would like that and given that they were the main people saying it <laughs> it's convenient i don't think they even were the main people saying it i think it no i know up by planners whole, who were like um, by a whole other kind of snake well we oil could try discourse. and do something hard or we could just buying some money at someone no well it also was like classic sort of 90s technocracy you know let us not concern ourselves with the hard grinding work of addressing social problems and all of this kind of thing let us instead focus on the media friendly spectacle of governance yeah it's kind of postmodern. the image is reality the sort of super criticality of lots of people in the same place rubbing together and creating extreme civilization what that what the city actually is well it is that's what it is in corbusier isn't it that's the reason why we still need cities at all yeah it's not quite it's not quite that sensible though it's a bit sort of it's a bit cosmic order as well i know i keep banging on about cosmic order but it's kind of useful because we think of him as so rational i don't think we necessarily need to go through the book i've got a couple of images in the book that i'd like but i think it'd be this was what was laid out in the pavilion of the esprit nouveau one side of it was a presentation of these two proposals and the other side was a was like in theory a one-to-one scale unit one of presumably three or four types well i want to say something first which is that the the esprit nouveau pavilion in 1925 isn't the first outing of this particular proposal this one had been submitted first to the salon d'automne in i think 1923 so i think what happened is he did the maison citroen in 1922 and then i think this is what he did for the year after. It's a ville contemporaine or something. You, when you'd pronounce it properly. Une ville contemporaine. Oh, that wasn't too bad. Yeah. Can't do ours. It's really, it's really bad. <laughs> well, let's describe it from the way in which it first appears, which is this plan, well, at an extremely great scale, from an extremely great height. And what appears is this broadly rectangular figure yeah, I see what you got. That your one is really distorted. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's more it's more distorted even than you think, actually. Yeah. So they did that in every English language edition. <laughs> so well, I'll describe the way it's meant to look. Um, it's it's a rectangular figure in the centre of a series of 
intersecting diagonal routes and it's arranged it's extremely reminiscent of like a uh of these plans of um of uh peking slash beijing depending on what era you're in um or or for our listeners in the early 20th century yeah yeah yeah. or or um or equally like kyoto or something like that a, a rectangular city plan oriented on the cardinal points of the compass and then in in the case of this city those are then all by bi- also bisected by things going on the 45 degree angle so that grid that you've got on your plan is met those should be all at 45 degrees and the the thing itself should actually be a rectangle which is a bit wider than it is high so that in in contrast to these um, East Asian archetypes where the principal axis is north-south and they tend to be higher than they are wide, this is on its side um, and is wider than it is tall. What you're seeing is this very strong graphic geometry. In the middle, there are these cross-shaped forms uh, and then around that there is sort of broadly i mean it's a broadly kind of circular um zone of uh, uh kind of like stepping kind of jigsaw shaped forms and then the outermost corners of the rectangle are these sort of rectangular block forms and then the whole is well it's situated actually in there's a, there's a kind of countryside around it, isn't there? It's situated within um, uh, within a city area, within a within a kind of zone. Yeah, there's that, and then actually beyond that, in theory, there's another layer of sort of garden city. But quite rightly, it's not imagined in free space. There is a canalised river. Um, there's a sort of agriculture beyond, and there is also little scraps of sort of the previous urban condition off in one corner, which are kind of imagined to still sort of be there amidst this new city. We should say uh, that the, this plan is described as a city, a contemporary city for 3 million inhabit- inhabitants. In fact, what we see in this plan is only a city for 1 million inhabitants because it, it's cropped off the Cité Jardin, these kind of um, suburban, suburban, suburban exurbs, suburbs. which are meant to contain two-thirds of the population. Well, but I mean, in fact, I think the, the grid of roads that otherwise make no sense around the outer side of it are just full of Garden City. I think that the Garden City is just off the edge of so this plan. So are these the Garden City? I think they might be creeping in a tiny bit. One of the key ideas about how this is structured is that there is a really big buffer between the city gardens and the city itself that they have to be insulated from the noise and you know potential sort of nervous disturbance of the city by a buffer of some 12 kilometers or something building built area is incredibly sparse it's just an enormous amount of wilderness yeah but yeah so you've got this thing that looks like a computer chip basically and it has some slightly more granular detail to it there is a there is a sort of center of culture around a massive square in the middle with four towers in it there's a great park taking up some 20 percent um amidst this garden city and the, you know there's an there's there's the obligatory airfields and um you know centers of recreation he talks um in various places about these these subdivisions of the population of the city. So that I think that this kind of top level division of people is people who live in the city and work in the city, people who live in the suburbs and work in the suburbs, and people who live in the suburbs and work in the city. And I, I kind of think you might think that there's a million of each of those. And then within this central rectangle, there is this division into three again. There is what we raised already these enormous 60-storey towers. Or even more, 100-storey. With a cross-shaped plan, of which there are 24. And then there are two sorts of um, of apartment building. Well, they're both, they're both the same height. They're both six double storeys. Oh, I think or one, one, is... can be, one can be more, but actually isn't... When you yeah. see the axos, they're always the same height. Yeah, they're, they're pretty similar. I think one is meant to be six and one is meant to be five. And they all, they're, everything is duplex, though. So. Um, and essentially they have two differences with each other one is a sort of it wiggles is like an s shape with right angles and it has double height balconies and one is uh rectangles blocks so with a courtyard in the middle 
and they have courtyards that go right through the building. So with, with two aspects, which are so each each flat is two stories tall, two thirds of it is flat, and one third of it is a double height garden, yeah. which goes right through the block. The rest of the land is mainly actually used for like agriculture and recreation. In the centre of the city, there really isn't any of that. I think it's just English garden. I think it's just land, landscape garden, basically. Yeah. Um, but with enormous amounts of transport infrastructure. Yeah. There are five levels, if I remember rightly. Yeah, these principal, these principal traffic routes, they're segregated in lots of different ways. The lowest level is heavy goods vehicles. No, the lowest level is intercity trains, I think. Oh, right, yeah. So intercity trains suburban trains commuter trains com- me- yeah like metro trains which stop the the city is set up with this grid of uh, 400 meters and the i think the metros are meant to stop every or they're meant to stop at every intersection of the roads yeah and then for traffic you have a separation between vehicle g- delivery vehicles and uh, private motor cars and then there's another then there are two separations for private cars one of which goes at a minimum of 60 miles an hour all the time and is like these super motorways everywhere. And then there's the local road system, um, which is separated by height. And all these things actually go through the buildings. Uh, or the buildings have bridges over them. No one ever carries anything into a building. Everything is delivered by lifts. So every every building has, has got these interchanges. And they also, all the buildings really have ways of getting light aircraft onto them so that they can be shuttled to and from the airport. So there's this huge web of massive roads and rail everywhere, it's suffusing the city. Here's a description of the experience of driving through it, where he's countering various things. You know, he has these imagined journeys where you're swept in at amazing speed. The city is so the experience, the aesthetic experience is so exciting because you encompass this amazing change because you're going so quickly so you like you rattle through suburbia through these different categories of space and you experience wonder at the at the changing like environment you experience his promenade that he has through buildings just with great speed you also experience all of these intersections where you suddenly you know spiral down from the super fast thing on a loop into the local road and then into your car goes into your building. All buildings have big car parks underneath them. The car parks are never in open land. They're always sort of buried. And all the buildings have got a, 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 a lot of kind of buried infrastructure under them. The service station for the servants who served all the service apartments. The huge cold rooms for the kind of concession store which buys things in collectively from the countryside uh, vehicle maintenance stations are all in this vulcan depth so the yeah the entire pulsating center of the city is all condensed it's not really separated the 24 towers contain a mix of everything it's all in yeah, there yeah it suggests that they are for industrial business and residential use yeah. and leisure use well, there's 600,000 people living in the 24 Towers, I think. Yeah, so. and actually around the 24 Towers usually has a low-level ribbon of buildings, which may be specialist sort of cultural buildings or something. It's important that these are these monumentally vast buildings surrounded by enormous expanses of um, landscape garden. 95% open. Yeah. And all the roads, except for the local roads, don't touch the ground. So actually... You've got to imagine it is uh, 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 the ground floor as almost unbroken um, landscape garden, which has at a high level viaducts yeah. on stilts. I think that there's a mistake that people make potentially where, because the descendants of this vision in post war planning are things which lots of people have experienced, perhaps we underestimate how different from them the actual scale of this vision is this is like an order of magnitude more excessive like anything that that has been built that's like this has been value engineered so you just don't have that much transport infrastructure you don't have that much open space the towers aren't that tall they don't have all the mod cons and infrastructure isn't all buried or raised so his vision essentially you could walk without really crossing a worrisome road or rail thing 
from one end of the city to the other in essentially completely open garden. So you'd be walking through this landscape of massive buildings, but an open landscape. And I think he also imagined that there would be, even in the zone, say, of all towers or of all, that there would be changes. I think we should imagine this um, this garden as also being full of little pavilions and restaurants and things. It's it's the place for entertainment and diversion of all kinds. Tennis courts, you know, all these... Uh... Little sort of belvedere's where you sit up and have coffee and look over the look over in wonder and excitement at this rugged landscape of trees extending for miles amidst the great gleaming glass towers. I mean, and is the, are we also looking at quite a clear hierarchy? I mean, I think we are, aren't we? I think, in a way, he... Um, has a sort of an idea in mind of the social structure of the city, but to him that's not the key point. Um, I think the idea in mind he has is that the capitalist class will live in the towers and have villas on the outside, and they will have their businesses in the same towers sort of thing. All that kind of commercial core class, and then the kind of Clark class will either commute in from the green belt or, you know, and perhaps, uh, you know, s- uh, sort of different notions like that. But I don't think it's really articulated. I think he's not trying to upset the social order. No, definitely not. I think that, I mean, I think this is envis- envisaged slotting very comfortably into an existing social order. Yeah, but I, don't, I also don't think he'd mind if it was, a, I think he'd be perfectly happy with it being a fascist one paradise or a communist paradise or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as he gets um, to build the buildings. As long as he gets to build a massive thing. I think the mode of social, he has a sort of mode of social organisation in mind, which I would say probably is essentially just conservative. Yeah. But that's not the key point for him. The cruciform skyscraper is a strange one and it's not really one that anyone has spent a lot of time with. Well, lots of people built three triform ones. Um, which work better. The cruciform ones have some terrible shading on one one of the sides of the cruciform where um, all the flats get no daylight ever. Whereas the the sort of tricorn version, which I think has been built fairly extensively, I mean, not at that size. All the circulation goes up and down the core yeah. and then you have these these corridors heading out and then the, to describe it in more detail, the arms of the cross also have a kind of serrated profile which i think is means that light can come into can kind of come closer to the the inner corridor yeah as well as going it's, out to the i mean it also is a bit like sort of trick it's almost like ruth franklin you know which which employs a similar thing it's almost like a giant bay window i was thinking about it because I, it, it's it's interesting that although he does do mass housing later in his career he never doesn't actually really want to do towers i think he has a go at them here but he's already struggling with I think he's sort of struggling against another inclination of his, which is actually that he wants the main organising axis of these things to be horizontal rather than vertical, and that horizontality is much more... He's reaching toward the street and the sky, I think. And they don't really work. People have had a go at them in really in high-rise. You know, you can bridge between things at some high level. You can bridge between a few towers and have like something for um, photoshopped people to kind of run around in and um sip coffee around uh Chuck swimming TVs pools off, suspended yeah. at the 40th story um but it's not entirely plausible yeah well i think the reason he doesn't ever build them is because i don't think they'd be any good no it doesn't seem that good does it in fact the whole city <laughs> it has some major problems doesn't it how should we talk about this city like look up pictures of it he did a lot of great images either perspectives there's lots of great axos i expect we'll put some up we can we're we're focusing on the towers we can talk about the other flats when we talk a little bit more about the esprit nouveau pavilion because the funny thing another thing about what mentioned about the towers is he like the the two other forms he plans them he has drawn them out to a point where you can imagine where the furniture goes the tower he never plans at all. The tower's totally generic, isn't it? He never plans. He says industry, business, and people are going to live in them, but he never even really attempts to show how. You know, it's just um, it's just a diagram of extreme densification. Not just. It's also to be viewed from the landscape garden. In that sense, it has a little bit in common with that ambiguous techno-futuristic city of, of a similar period, the one by um, Ludwig Hilbersheimer, where... Everything is reduced to cuboids, basically. 
yeah, this kind of uh, cuboidal, cuboidal just, hive. The difference is the landscape garden. Yeah. Hilversheim city is, is like a circuit diagram. He has no place for trees. One, one thing we should go through, actually, in, from the book is his arguments for and against and how it works. The way it's structured in the book is that we have uh, this outline of the city and then we ha- it's structured around these two chapters, the hours of work and the hours of leisure. The hours of work are really retreading a lot of arguments around circulation and the need for people to move as fast as possible. The hours of leisure are, again, about the, um, the garden. He has this idea that human scale, we need some human scale in this city of these monstrously vast crystalline monoliths uh, and trees are going to do it or his characterization of what makes cities good is completely Wrong. it's completely fanciful it's completely tendentious the idea that you could decant all of the activity of the city into these enormous towers and it would continue to function in the same way i think all, it should be sort of self-evidently clear that that's not going to happen it, it's not that there's only one particular way for a city to exist. I very much dissent from this kind of Jane Jacobs-inspired view that there's a particular way that streets work and everything has to work like that. I think if you go to cities like Tokyo, there are lots of places which have very unlikely sort of forms of urban forms and circulation and things which actually function very well. But I would be very uncertain about the success of... <laughs> Um, no, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's got, it's, these it, enormous uh, the things he works against density. He works against accident, which is, I think, one of the points of density is that p- things are brought together whether they like it or not. Yeah, the idea That's is- what forces interactions to happen and work is that there is the potential for chance, and he has eliminated chance by the fact that if you're going on in a tower, there is always a wall separating you. There is no public space. And the public space is so vast, dense and empty um, and so suffused with transport infrastructure. And your interactions are all designed so that you never have to go on a street and interact with someone. Everything is delivered immediately to your house. Everything is centred around the home. His reclusive general work life is highly reflected in his ideal for human habitation, which is that occasionally you will venture out of your home and do great work and then return and everything is brought to you. There is the, the, there is such a limited capacity in this for you to go out and create potential. The the space in which that kind of character and accident is going to happen is this enormous English garden with its winding paths, which somehow is going to be... There will be a, a kind of charming and characterful restaurant around every corner, in spite of the fact that you've probably had to walk about 800 metres. Or in spite of the fact that there have to be 60,000 of them or some grotesque number of pavilions, all presumably exactly the same. It's incredibly dense, but the vision for... The kind of vision of a life is a suburban one, isn't it? You know, you've got your little... monastic. You've got your little module, you're hygienically separated from everyone else, and you go point to point and fulfil activities on this little atomised... itinerary but it's also monastic it's about cells and contemplation of vast scenes there are different sorts of objections that you can have aren't there there's one way you can just sort of say that in entirely sort of uprooting and reconstituting the urban form you've actually destroyed everything which makes a city a city and maybe a less emphatic way of objecting to it is just saying that because of these peculiar obsessions that he has this is a city which is monstrously over-endowed in some things and monstrously kind of under-endowed in others. He's identified a real problem in cities, which is, or a real problem for the 20th century city, which is the intrusion of the motor car and the traffic and the noise and the pollution which it causes. But I think that like all of the really great, or certainly the majority of the really great errors of 20th century urbanism are attempts to accommodate rather than to frustrate that one of the things i find a bit strange about this is that in his architecture he's not all that excessive is he but he has quite a good one of the things you see in his domestic architecture is the rooms are not super massive there are they tend to be quite carefully scaled they don't dwarf you 
So why is everything in his urbanism so so sort of over the top? Why does he think that everyone wants three square kilometres of tennis courts next to every house? I you think, know, what's... well, my, my theory for is it is it is going back to the monastery that he likes, is that you are um, in a monk's cell made nicer in a sublime landscape of rugged cliffs and monumental forms and your relationship of your smallness to its bigness is inspiring and sublime which i guess it is i mean it's a nice thing to look across an enormous metropolis but this one is there's nothing to do no it's like it's like a mountain range it's like being a monk in a mountain range except that there are various accommodations to the fact that you're in a city but i think that was the way he mostly lived his life is that he had a, an interaction with the sublime and an interaction with the humane yeah. at a level and um that was what he and he wasn't a great i don't think he went down the pub every you know twice a week uh, I, I don't get the sense that he like was a member of a bowling club or i mean i think he sort of did cycle around and spend time in cafes and things which i guess is a kind of equivalent but i don't think he ever really considered it and i think you can see even where he is not really where the locusts of his where where his attention isn't you can see some problems his attention isn't in the design of actually what goes on in the towers yeah. doesn't care they just have to be there his attention isn't really in the parkland i've never seen a drawing of parkland that's at all convincing in terms of how the pavilions work sure there are these things here and then in the big thing, they're all exactly the same. Yeah. Or they're like super... I've never seen this drawing of like how the parkland is really. His attention's not there. It's not in the towers. It's not in that. His attention is in how a slab block works with like loads of transport and how the flat in the slab block like all relate to each other. But the problem is it's not really a monastic vision, is it? Because it's a bit like being a monk in Versailles or something. It's not. It, it's not. It's not Mount Athos. It's this enormous um, manifestation of order and grandeur, and it has some sublime elements because of the inhuman scale of the buildings. No, no. But I think those are the things he's struggling toward. I think those are the things he likes. He likes saying the building should be a long way back from the road and much, much higher because that's more sublime. I mean, what's the what's the other advantage of it? The density is not really improved very much. Like, but like by doing that, you're not actually really improving the density. You're just making the buildings bigger and further apart. Yeah. Normally, we would like to say, I would say the orthodoxy now is that you want moderately big buildings right close together. Yeah. <laughs> there are loads more drawings of this than you've probably seen. I think the nice ones are... Of, I think the best bits of design are the design of the slab blocks. That's the, the, that's where the best thinking is. So should we discuss the Plan Voisin quickly? Shall I articulate the conceit and then you can talk about it? Because I think you've probably got more thoughts in line. So the conceit is this, that um, the centre, the historic centre of Paris, the Marais and things, is going to be, over time, replaced with a grid of these super big towers with parkland between them. And this is going to be achieved by first... Um, demolishing the little 5% of land that the towers are on, building the huge towers, moving everyone out of their existing buildings into the towers, and then demolishing the 99% of not very interesting Paris, according to his notion, and replacing it with um, scrubland and huge motorways, um, keeping some little bits of little historic buildings. And, you know, over the course of 30 years, that will be achieved... And then the centre of the city will be much improved with these huge tab blocks. It was sponsored by a manufacturer of cars and aeroplanes, Voisin, um, as a provocative speculation into what could be a future of cities and a promotion of the ideals of the mechanical age of cars and planes and things. Uh, and um, it was the most controversial part of the Esprit Nouveau pavilion in the exhibition the thing i want to start off talking about is the difference between the plan voisin and the city for three million because although they contain lots of the same elements they distributed in a slightly different way in the plan voisin there are some other things to talk about we're looking at this big 
lavishly detailed axonometric, which we'll put up on the Instagram, which you should be following if you if you aren't already. The plan voisin, in some ways, is stripped down. In some ways, contains some sort of slightly different elements, and I think it's interesting to talk about what they are. The insertion is within and is contained by the fabric of the existing city. So it doesn't, as the city for three million does, have this gradient shift out into absolute green parkland at the edge, but rather ends quite abruptly. So it's it's surrounded, and the grid of roads is tighter as well. I think partly to try and integrate with the existing city plan. Do you think? Yes, I think it's a little bit denser, and it doesn't have the suburbia because it's plugging into the suburbia of Paris. Although I don't think he ever really intellectually integrated the suburbia and the city. He has a 1 to 500 scale, or maybe even 1 to 200 scale understanding of the suburbia. Probably 1 to 500 scale. But he never manages really to understand how that interacts. The drawing of the suburbia in the city for 3 million is completely linear drawing of these looping motorway routes and then just some writing on it there's not not even motorway routes they're trains he says it's going to have a set of four circular they're not actually in the plan as we said but already the city for three million plan really only shows the most important million it has the bright light of the city where the strong are raised up and the weak are crushed it doesn't have the bucolic peaceful hinterland where the weak labour in ex- obscurity, growing their parsnips or whatever. I think we could talk a little bit about this drawing because it's an interesting one. It's You can tell where it is only by... There's a very little bit of existing city fabric distributed around the edges, so you can see coloured in like very grey and very bleak looking. But it, there's a tiny little bit of it in the extreme top right and extreme bottom left. The emphasis on circulation is conveyed through the fact that we can see millions of these tiny little cars, but which all appear almost as sort of mouse droppings, these little black dots scattered across. And they, in places, you know, where the actual edges of the roads are meant to be is quite obscure, and it's really just indicated by these sort of flow of iron filings. So you can see they're sort of streaming. Sometimes they seem to move in a circle. Well, the whole thing is just a big road. I think the cars can drive all over the square. Yeah, they seem to be. The square, which is the centrepiece of it, is ringed by slabs. It's super massive. What is what is the square? The square is... It's about 600 by 300, I think, the square. Well, it has very significantly the shadow of an enormous aeroplane passing across it. And it also has marooned in it some little bits of sort of quasi-Roman symbolic fragment. It's got these two... Arc de Triomphe looking things. It's unclear to me whether they are recovered or moved or just built from or scratch. Built from scratch. Yeah. He, he, uh, the city for three million has huge arches over the entrances. And it's also got these two huge columns. Oh yeah, obelisks or yeah. chimneys. Little bits of sort of Tuileries style garden. In the- Although it's a square, because it's got this, in, this huge dual carriageway going through the middle of it. How many lanes has that road got, do you think? <laughs> well, they're not observing very good lane discipline. But, but I think it's about, <laughs> it's I think about it's like four. seven or eight in either direction. Oh, no, it's way more than four. Look. It has a flyover in the middle. But don't worry, you can't walk under the flyover. No, that's just for more cars. It has three layers of motorway on top of each other in the middle. And then otherwise, the big module of the Blanc Voisin is the Cruciform skyscraper, but this time sitting on a relatively small island of greenery which is probably about 200 by 200. And we were talking earlier about what these linear, they look a bit like kind of shortbread biscuit things scattered around the base are. They think that there's something to do with the traffic infrastructure because people seem to be driving off the roads into them. It's not clear what they are. They look like maybe enormous bus stop. They look like a bad idea. A lot of this looks just like a bad idea. The more I think about it, not a great place to live. Right, you had observations about the advantages of this. The advantages? As opposed to the City of Three Million. Oh, I'm not sure they're exactly observations of advantage. I think that in comparison, there's generally, because they're so obviously related, I think that something you can miss is that they are clearly 
foregrounding or accentuating different qualities of the scheme. So in the city for three million, it's really all about the parkland and the greenery and this green cordon sanitaire between the inner city and the outer suburbs and the garden-like experience of walking through the parkland and seeing these enormous skyscrapers in their crystalline magnificence. I think other things are accentuated in the Plan Voisin. I think that the circulation... Roads, roads, motorways. You know, this drawing, this drawing which is really all about cars, and self-evidently the idea of urban clearance and rebuilding is really the key structuring provocation. I think upon reflection that like the parkland is a more significant part of the legacy of this scheme than any other element not because the other things didn't happen but because I think they would probably have happened anyway whereas this seems to me to be something which is more specific to this particular formulation of the new city and its planning I mean I think another way of approaching this is to say what does the world look like in when neither of these schemes was ever proposed and people had to draw on other influences and i think though what would have still have happened and what would have happened differently that i think is my rationale for thinking that the city for three million potentially has a greater influence because it has more parkland because i think the parkland is the thing which i can imagine not being there the focus from the mid 19th century on both practically and theoretically of the garden and the green as what was lost in the process of the construction of great cities. So the hay wain, driven out by mechanisation and improvements, is driven into the dark satanic mills and loses the bucolic idyll. In England, at a practical level, the parks movement, the garden cities movement, the movement to give allotments... The urge towards green is incredibly strong. The idea, I think, that a new city should have green throughout the centre, I'm not sure is so radical. But the idea that you should demolish the centre of Paris to put green around the towers is, I think, a very unusual move. Yeah. Are there other key drawings that we want to talk about? The base invader plan. I'll describe the plan and then you can talk about your thoughts because I think you've probably got more thoughts than me. This is a rectangular plan, slightly more stretched. It's about the shape of a full scap piece of paper. It is divided in two. The bottom half is the Marais in Paris with a huge motorway has been driven through it at an angle. It's an aerial photo. And the top half is this grid of the huge cruciform skyscrapers. There are four of them complete but there's sort of notions of bits more of the grid. And the grid itself is actually squashed at an angle. The top is very white and the bottom is very black, giving it very strong graphical appearance with this motorway cut through. There's a bit of granularity to the top half with some sort of other buildings and things, but it's mainly this repeating unit of the tower, the strange clone stamp ground format around it the entourage if we're going to do the beaux-arts um. yeah, yeah but it feels very digital tower cruciform its shadow the roads around it they all seem to have the same grim collection of tussocks transport infrastructure loop spiral and that's against the grain the dark grain as he would call it of the seventh circle of hell prosperous inner city of paris with its tight streets a regular grid courtyards and it looks like one is erasing the other. It's The edge of it is a real crystal boundary. They're coming down and they're eating it. It's an amazing image. Yeah. It looks very much like something that could be produced, I mean, basically at any point, actually, in modernism. But later on, it would be a comment, whereas now it's a literal proposal. This is something that I think Rem Koolhaas could have done. It's something that Rossi t- sort of did do. It's something, and I think it could come up, various periods before but here it is not presented with a nod towards the ironic relationship with history which i think if it was rem he would be making a comment about time about space this is about superiority this is about it's almost nietzschean one thing overcoming the other for me The grid has been distorted so that it's a a kind of rhombus grid and i think that that's because of various existing routes which he wants to incorporate 
I don't. I'm not sure there is that much more to say about it. The, the I mean, yes, it's incredibly influential. All those early Cool House projects, the early OMA stuff, the voluntary prisoners of architecture. It's all, uh, I think, very consciously in this this mode. I mean, yeah, you see that his control of graphics, his real mastery of drawing, which I think is very important. It's very important in the way that he's able to have an impact. What do you think he was trying to say with this image? Well, I think that it's the thing has been halved and it's very obviously a comparison between the scale of one and the other, the uniformity of the one above and the mess of the of the one below. But he is, um, I think, in this image, proposing to keep the bottom bit, albeit with the huge motorway driven through it, and he is proposing to cut it like a knife. Yeah, you can see the surgery. The surgery is in progress. Yeah, and you can see a little bit of this strange square creeping into the top right corner. I don't, having looked at it, think it's actually a literal part of the plan. Why is that? I think it is just graphical presentation. Yeah, it doesn't... I don't think you could really locate it. He obviously did an awful lot of drawings for this, for the exhibition. It's not a very good reproduction, but there's this aerial view of all of the enormous towers. They're kind of cruciform, but then toothed in plan, so that they create these very stark shadows in the various renderings. And you can see the Seine in the foreground. Although he never draws the dark side. One side of it is perpetually shrouded in darkness. Yeah, he's not drawing that. Yeah, the park has all become... It's all there. Probably half of the figure ground is parkland. All the same, it comes across as a little bit perfunctory because the relative scale of the the tower to the parkland is such... The park all feels a little bit like this little puddle of greenery that it's sitting in. But this is very like what it actually was like, isn't it? Yeah. That parkland is very much like post-war parkland. It's maybe like one of the better examples, like Roehampton, but it has more sort of infrastructure in it. I think we've both lived in buildings with this sort of parkland outside it. It can either be a sort of drifts of plastic bags or, depending on the people who live there, nicely manicured and sterile. Around towers, it doesn't tend to be a house, a place of sort of children's gay laughter. Exercise of dogs? Exercise and excretion, yes. Yeah. So should we talk about the question of influence? Because yeah. this plans its infamy, its status in in a sense as the kind of original sin of international modernism. This is what pollutes everything which comes afterwards and leads people into all sorts of unpleasant and vicious follies. I think it needs to be unpacked a bit. Sure. And I think it needs to be unpacked because there's so much in here. Much of it is pernicious, but it's in different ways. And I think that the problem of lumping everything in under the infamous image of bad modern architecture is that it it's fundamentally leads to purely kind of conservative response where it's like well just don't do anything or build houses that look like houses or whatever or you know it or it doesn't lead to a to a productive critique unless you really i think break it down into its constituent it's funny because it or an irony is that the response to this has led to an urbanism far more reactionary and commercially driven than the one that preceded it in the Anglo-Saxon world, anyway, well, in England, yeah. it led to, a, I think, one of the worst periods of sort of civil thought. <laughs> I'm not sure what what you can really say in its favour, particularly. It, I think that the mo- I mean, the important thing, and it's a precedent which he himself is explicit about, is that actually this had been done within living memory in Paris already on a pretty large scale, um, and that the sort of Osman demolition of Paris had been going on you know between 10 and 20 years before he'd been born well 20 20 to 30 years it was significantly closer yeah I mean it was it was significantly closer to his time then than this proposal is to us now it was 60 years 60 and a bit years prior and this is now nearly a century ago 90 years ago yeah I mean it, it had the same sort of relation then that I guess the many of the projects of the post-war do to us now in time and the reason why he's put them where he has is because he's knocking down the remaining uh, non housemanized bits of Paris there's a moment when he says he's a picture of the Marais which is now just about the sort of richest and most fashionable bit that's got some French people in it, and says, 
is this the seventh circle of hell? But then people thought that about lots of places, didn't they? I mean, well, they probably had they probably had more scenic poor people in them back yeah, then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even in the post-war period, uh, I think people people aren't aware of quite how abject a lot of these now very um, you know bobo areas really were. That they were lots and lots of houses. They were filthy. They didn't have any sanitation. And although people were wrong to identify their, them, therefore, as kind of irredeemable slums which had to be cleared and uh, terminated with um, extreme prejudice, you can see much more where the idea came from or how they got it into their heads. I think it's less outrageous or, is, you know, it, it, its context is a lot more complex than um, people have tended to, to recognise. Like, in the moment, it's obviously a provocation. I don't think it's serious. Do you think if someone had said, let's do it? I think he would have been up for knocking down some bits of Paris. I think without a shadow of a doubt, he would have been totally happy to knock everything down that he knocks down in this um, and replace it tabula rasa. I don't think he would have any problem with that. Yeah, but I don't, it wouldn't have looked like this. And I think also that his attitude to history, he sees historic buildings rather like people see, you know, the Mona Lisa or whatever. It's a kind of movable. It's an item. It's an well, object. Well, that itself isn't that insane. I mean, they'd moved... Um, a, a number of buildings for Hausmann. He chose to sort of test 10 best buildings and um, they just moved them. He's drawing on lots of, on the parts of existing theory and practice that he wants. Obviously, he has a kind of wrong-headed conception of history, which is that you can just pluck all of these little pearls of uh, heritage out of the out of the urban fabric and that they retain some meaning, even isolated in Parkland. But But actually that it also completely destroys the character of the city, its social networks, and makes their recreation nigh on impossible by a pernicious urban form. I actually think this sort of urban form of like big towers with nothing between them is is pernicious. I think the bit that's most wrong, more wrong in urbanism than the bit that talks about the current city is the bit that talks about the universal city. Like, the idea that one of the great things about the universal city is that it is grid-like is a totally asinine observation. It's complete nonsense. It can be grid-like or it cannot be grid-like. It makes almost no difference. One of the things which is interesting about the, the examples which he cites, so, you know, Beijing, yeah, there's, it was a grid system, but then when you come off the grid, everything is com- these completely irregular courtyard houses. So the, the grid exists at a certain scale, but then the inhabited experience of the city then sort of departs from the grid at certain points it's just, it, you know it's it's something which sometimes obtains and sometimes doesn't i'm grid, i'm totally grid agnostic that another thing that's really important about cities is primal shapes that's nonsense i don't think actually we said this i should have said this when we were going through everything he says in urbanism is nonsense <laughs> Grid? grids right angles uh They're both nonsense. primary form that's nonsense um the but yeah, especially in urban spaces. Yeah, his his idea about order in urban spaces is complete. Is actually the op like the first lot of things are I'm agnostic about. I think it doesn't make any difference. His notion about urban space is actively the opposite of right. I'm not sure there is. I'm not sure what else there is. Then there's just all, all of the car stuff. Yeah, I think that it's very difficult to sympathise with any of the ideas really. And I think that he he has a great feeling for what makes a building pleasurable to experience and to enjoy but i think he really doesn't understand cities i'm not sure he even really understands the occupation of houses what he's really good at is space and promenade maybe we should return to the point that we started at which is um that all of these things are displayed at this um this international exposition of decorative arts which was a big success the yeah so it has the the pavilion has two parts there's this sort of elliptical uh, bit which has all the exhibits of the cities of the future in it and then there's this little individual module which is um a module from one of the slab block typologies that he's come up with it's a duplex it's on two levels the plan is essentially a square in one corner of the square an area which is sort of roughly a third of the overall is cut out and is a double level garden it's like a complete absence Um, and then so that you're left with the remainder of the form is an l-shaped kind of inverted l 
depending on which way around you're looking at the plan. Uh, and then the bottom of the L next to the garden is a double height living room. And then the rest of it is, you know, this, this, this by now quite familiar mixture of service spaces and uh, relatively modest bedrooms and other things. It's also kitted out. Uh, it's got some elements of his um, play with circulation. It's very much, you know, it's very much like a vision of better living. It has it has all of the um, of the accessories of the good life, yeah, as well got, as the essential architectural form. Industrial products also the, the the Bentwood steam chairs, the club club armchairs, and you know, which is a sort of more slightly dare I say it decoy armchair. A certain amount of purist art. Yeah, it's got a lot of his paintings. Um, it's got. I mean, the pictures. It does look nice. It looks like nice. Uh, it's very like Citroën. It's like it's it's stripped back quite a long way from Villa La Roche. It doesn't have. It's perhaps like the genre half of Villa La Roche. It's probably the closest thing to, but without as much emphasis on the roof garden and and with a simplified circulation on the outside. Also, something I haven't mentioned. There's a huge uh, graphic, which I think is a sort of another part of the propaganda. This is is combining his urban notion, his big building notion, his house notion, and his graphical sensibility and his industrial furnishings and uh, things like that all into one. He's also done something. Normally, I think he's an architect who actually doesn't respond best to constrained circumstances, but because I think he wasn't terribly popular um, with the conveners of the exhibition uh, because he'd not been very nice to them I think mainly uh, or, and very nice about them yeah, I think it's, yeah, quite could be quite difficult <laughs> I think he had been difficult and I think he then uh, complained as many difficult people do of persecution. They'd given him a slightly difficult site with a lot of trees in it but um, he's managed to integrate them quite well into the inside of the building. Yes yeah, so they're kind of going all the way up through through the garden courtyard. They also um, built a, 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 a hoarding so that people couldn't see his building from the outside before the exhibition yeah. um which there's an argument about whether or not this is him and his radical um style being martyred by the hideous establishment or just that um uh they wanted to unveil it complete uh, uh, um and didn't want to have the building site on display uh i don't have an opinion on that really i retain a kind of ambivalence about these works even though i don't think that they're a good idea in the way that they're proposed. I think for various reasons. Well, I think their success is a rhetorical one. Uh, at a really obvious level, they're a successful piece of rhetoric because they got everyone talking. They got him more famous, rather like uh, as a great flourish at the end of um, the Esprit Nouveau period. It's, it's very expansive. Also, as a rhetorical device, it sort of... Um, you know how uh, people who, when they want to say something extremely racist or something, they say we're just raising the issues. You know, you've just done something really quite despicable to raise. I'm just raising the issues. Well, it's not complete nonsense. He is um, creating a piece which allows us to think about um, these cities uh, before they happened to start the process of testing the nature of that city. I think the great problem is that it is insufficiently tested. He hasn't, because it, he is trying to promote the positive aspects of an idea, he fails to examine what even for him, it, we can see from his attention, are the weak points. Yeah, I guess the only point I'm making, which is sort of semi in favour of, or which is suggesting that, that this is not got, you know... The city hasn't finished evolving, it hasn't finished changing. It's going to go on, and it's going to go on changing a lot. Revolutionary changes in the form of the city actually is a thing which we should still think of as being possible. If it's going to change, we might as well have intentional change rather than this sort of undead process of, like, this kind of London plan sort of change, where I don't think any no one has thought, well, actually, this is a really good type, this is what we should be moving towards things have just got tweaked around and about and what we've ended up in with is this particular type which I think has really serious problems in all sorts of ways and that it's not like we shouldn't... But it wasn't just the planning that brought about that type. It was a strange set of policy which and just economic conditions, I'd say. Yeah, sure, but that's, it's still something which which you might do intentionally rather than just sort of spectating and occasionally thinking in a vaguely psychogeographical way about how peculiar it is and uh, all this kind of thing. 
you know the buildings the types the types of buildings which we with which we populate the future city might as well be something that we actually think about in an active way rather than something which just kind of happens to fall on our heads i'm not sure i would generally advocate replacing one sort of urban condition with something which is massively like wholesalely changing it to something else i don't think that in a in in a mature city like ours i'm not sure that's often a good idea um unless it's been brought about by a like by one of the activities of the city ceasing or a component of the city dying off you know if the docks die off in a very big you've got a major wound and you're going to have to kind of graft into it in several stages and you're going to have to change things a lot it doesn't mean necessarily it doesn't say very much what you can do with the building fabric but like an entire way of life has gone you can make an intervention but i don't think that's true in battersea or here um i think uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't build big this is an argument for not building big buildings or not having big sites but i think probably i would say sure yeah we should think about those things but really i think the problem is that we don't have um we are the the planning is sufficient is is not interventionist enough and not um sort of deep and skilled enough to carry out a a, a, a heterodox plan um but i would say that is an argument which is the opposite of i I think um prescriptive monocultural Finnish city proposal it's a very useful proposal because it tells us what we shouldn't do <laughs> not only that oh, but one it, of the things it, yeah yeah that's one of the things one of the things is it shows us a future a future that we can step back from and perhaps if more people had looked at it seriously thought about it seriously they wouldn't have done everything they did Oh, God, I mean, we could really litigate all this for a long time. I mean, I think that, you know, I think that among the, you know, in terms of these, like, sterile monocultures, um, the sort of post-social democratic landscape of the Docklands is... I think it's got some extraordinarily bad bits in it. You remember, like, how how well they managed to cock up the little bit around where I... Like, just south of where I was. It's it's like like something which was... it's almost okay now because the natural condition of it is so lovely. Mm. It's got such a you know a lovely basin, all this sort of old bits of ruinous infrastructure and like beautiful old churches, and then they have managed to just like really sink their teeth into how to make that as kind of mediocre and crummy as possible. But I mean, all of these effects can be created in a very non plan voisin like architecture, as as well as any which claims any kind of um dissent from it okay well i think we're gonna have to stop talking aren't we yeah bye bye all right thanks a lot for listening thank you very much and uh do keep in touch this will probably go out quite a long time after it's recorded so um thank you in advance for all your kind words uh yeah do we want to do we want to where do we want to leave people i mean from the from the center of the two kilometer wide um, expanse of the the Ville Contemporaine as the cars whiz by you know, the biplanes scudding across under the clouds Um, we bid you a windswept farewell